This is the Hope Not Note podcast, where we answer your questions and share inspirational stories to fill your soul with hope. Our mission is to empower hope to those who have been plagued by note. I'm Dr. Dylan Caswell. And I'm Brandy. And we're here to bring you out of the note and into hope. Welcome back to the Hope Not Note podcast. And we are just a few short days away from our wedding anniversary, which we're excited about one whole year. Can you believe it? No. <laughs> but it means we get to eat a cannoli. Yeah. <laughs> we had cannolis instead of cake at our wedding, and it was lovely. <laughs> Italians for life. Anyways, welcome back to the podcast. We're excited that you are tuning in and have been listening for however long you've been listening. If this is your first episode, welcome. We have so many episodes that you can go back and listen to, but we're glad that this is your first episode. This episode is kind of unique. Um, very excited to hear Dylan's perspective on it, and I'm excited to share mine. So we're going to hop right in. It is from a listener named Drew, and he asks, are video games rotting my youth athlete's brain? Well, Drew, it kind of sounds like you have your perspective on this. <laughs> By the way, that that question is phrased that the assumption is that uh, your youth athlete's brain is rotting probably as you're listening to this <laughs> podcast right now. But I actually want to kind of change the conversation a little bit. Mm -hmm. Definitely going to answer the question, is it rotting your brain? It's typical. It depends yeah. because it's all about the dosing of this happening, right? We can look at anything and anything can rot anything if it's too much of it. If we have too much water, that can be a bad thing. If we eat too much food, that can be a bad thing. So if we have too much of anything, with the exception of hope, <laughs> then it can start to have detrimental effects. But the idea of this rotting the youth athlete's brain, it depends on what else the athlete is doing, right? There has to be balance in it. So if they're out, they're practicing, they're doing the verb, they're doing the thing, and then they come home and they're playing the video game, it can actually be really helpful. Because what research is showing is that by playing video games, kids or even older adults, they have the ability to improve their reaction time. And I want to pause and I want to point out one, one thing before we get into the meat and potatoes of this. It's funny because when an older person in a nursing home plays a video game, we celebrate it. We celebrate how much this video game is helping them to improve their balance, their reaction time, their strength, their standing capacity. It's on headlines, it's on news channels, but yet when a youth athlete plays a video game, it's the opposite. They're lazy, their brains are rotting. They don't care about anything that they're doing. And so this dynamic is very interesting. But with a youth athlete, if they're doing all the things that they should be doing, the practice, the moving, the conditioning, the training and all that, and then the game is a way for them to recover while still improving their reaction time, that can be a really big benefit, especially in sports like baseball and softball, volleyball, all the other sports that require reaction. For example, in softball or baseball, you have a very short distance to determine what pitch is coming at you. Is this a curveball? Is it a drop ball? Is it a slider? Is it a changeup? And then you have to predict what that pitch is and then create a motor response to try to use a circle bat to hit a circle ball. It's really like a huge physics problem that like baseball, you're batting a 300, you're incredible. It's, it's a hard sport, but the better reaction time you have, the better off that you're going to be. And I remember back a few years ago, there's another interesting study on most people in professional sports have near perfect vision. I think of how much of an advantage that is to pick up something like if you're 2020 versus if you're 2040, you now have 20 feet more time for your visual system to react and create the appropriate motor response. So this idea of what we're picking up in our visual field and then how our brain's able to predict the movement that needs to happen in order to become successful with that particular task, video games can help that while the person is recovering from the work that they've already put in. So so big thing there, if they've put the work in for the other things. The other benefits, and this definitely depends on what type of game they're playing, but let's say that we have a youth basketball player. They did their practice, they did their shooting drills, they did all those things. They get home at night and they hop on and they start playing some NBA 2K. They're seeing the game from a different perspective. They're seeing what plays work, 
what shot's a good shot and what shot's a bad shot. Because the way these games work is there's an algorithm. The better that the shot selection is, the more likely you are to score a point. The more that you can score points, the more likely you are to win that game. If you're not scoring points, you're not going to win. In the video game reward, you took a good shot. You took an open three-pointer with a good shooting athlete. You're going to likely make that. You're playing an old school game with Shaq at the three-point line. doesn't matter how open he is. Mm -hmm. He's not going to make that. So now you're learning how do we get the right people in the right position? And then how do we set up plays and get better shots? So that's just one example of being able to see the game from a different perspective. Now, a few years back, Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book Outliers, in which he referenced that to become an expert, you need deliberate practice. Now, this book was written and studied with musicians, young violinists and, and pianists. Within this 10,000 hour rule that says you need to accumulate 10,000 hours in this specific domain to become an expert in it, that made its way into the sports world, right? And that kind of youth sports specialization started to increase along with a lot of other things that we won't get into right now, financial incentives. But <laughs> this idea of you need 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert in this specific thing. What we forget is that if a kid is playing a video game that's related to their sport, that time counts towards that 10,000 hours. Because again, they're seeing how the game can be played. They're learning different things. They're seeing strategies. And then they might even go play in the yard with it. One of our neighbors, this kid runs in the yard with a Lamar Jackson jersey on, throws himself passes. It's so refreshing because I know when I was younger, I used to do that. Like after my brother was done playing with me because he got sick of me. He'd go inside and I'd sit there and I'd throw passes to myself. I'd tackle myself. I'd <laughs> score on myself. Basketball, I'd block myself against the backboard. But you'd see these things and you'd be like, you know what? I want to go. I, I want to go hit a fadeaway like Kobe Bryant. So you go practice it in the driveway and you're developing different skills and techniques that you're not going to get in practice because you take a fadeaway in practice and the coach gets pretty upset. That was a dumb shot. Why would you ever take that? And like, not that that's not accurate. But you develop a whole new skill set by playing a game or seeing it played on a video game and then going out and, and attempting it. And I think the last point that I'll put on to this, and then we'll go back to you, Brandy, <laughs> is it, it depends on what game it is that they're playing. But the other part of it is the community aspect of it. Sure. When we look at pro sports and training camps, they're bringing their TVs, they're bringing their Xboxes. They put a long, hard day in of work. And they get done, they get to relax. We talk about internal load all the time, how you adapt to these stressors. Well, part of it is community. And if the video games are bringing people together to have some downtime where they can joke around, have some fun with each other, that is great for recovery, which is going to be great for performance. Brittany used to coach basketball, traveling with, with the guys on the bus. Like someone starts up 2K, the bus lights up. Yeah. Like everyone gets excited. And here's the thing, they're playing the video game sport that they're going to go play in the next few hours. So everyone's a little bit ramped up and then you get to recover afterwards and, and bond and, and be with each other. I know there's times that like, I'll, I'll go out to visit my nephew and him and I will play Madden against each other. Cause it's just fun. It's just fun bonding. And what plays are you going to run? Who's going to throw it deep? Who's going to go for it on fourth down? Like you get to take risks that you wouldn't take in normal life and, and kind of learn from it. But, you know, there, there is a lot of benefits that we can take away from playing video games as a youth athlete. It doesn't mean that their brains are just being rotted, but it depends on what else are they doing outside of it. If they're just on the video game and not practicing it out, mm -hmm. physically doing the thing, well, then that's an issue. Mm -hmm. well, I want to speak to the language of, you know, your youth being, your youth's brain being rotted. It, it's maybe it's bold to assume this, but I'm just going to assume it anyways. I'm assuming that Drew believes that video games are like all bad, mm. or maybe he just has like a distaste in his mouth for video games in general and was hoping that we would confirm that so that he could <laughs> like show his kids that, hey, this is bad for you. But I, I also, I, I really want to invite drew and anybody else listening to enter into the life of that kid in their perspective because i'm not a video game player by any means growing up we had a really shady like cellar of a basement and we had a really small tv with a super nintendo and i think we had like two or three games one was like a donkey kong game 
One was like a Star Wars game and I don't even remember the other one. And I think I played those like maybe a handful of times. Like I'm not a video game person by any means. Did not grow up with one, whatever. However, my nephews are huge video game kids and I know nothing of what they're talking about, but I know that it matters to them and it's important to them. And so I encourage Drew and those people listening who don't know anything about video games to sit and just ask the questions, ask to learn, ask to be taught. But I remember one time I was trying to get my younger nephews to come, you know, play volleyball or basketball in the yard and they didn't want to. And so instead of forcing them, I tried to enter into something that they cared about and we didn't have the video games with us, but they were like, I want to go home and play video games. And I was like, well, tell me about the video games. So they literally went through every level in detail of what this video game was. And it was, I, my nephew was so encouraged that I cared enough to sit. I feel like it was probably an hour yeah. just listening to him explaining every single level. I had no idea what he was talking about, but he felt love that I was present to him. And his little brother was excited that he got to talk through the video game. And so I almost like, I, I invite the listeners to ask yourself, how can I enter into it? I don't think that learning about the video game and playing once in a while is harmful for you. I think it could actually be a bonding experience, but I do think that there is times where you, you know, should temper. It shouldn't be four hours of video games yeah. a day. You know, there is a balance. You are the parent. You do get to have, boundaries and rules within the house of when they can play and where they can play and and what time of day they can play and things like that don't lose that and if you don't have that establish that however entering into something that matters to your children goes a lot further than i think you give credit to yeah and to that point i've we, we've worked with some some clients and youth athletes and parents and there's this dynamic of Oh, they're always on video games and, and we can have the conversation. Well, there could be benefits to it. And they're like, not with this game. Like they're, they're playing Grand Theft Auto or something along those lines. And the question will like, well, where did they get that? Yeah. And, and like, if you don't want them to be playing that, like, why is that in the house? You get to establish the rules. Like the, the, the parents are the lead and we have to remember environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior, but we can shape the environment to shape the behavior. And we've had some athletes that, hey, it's summertime, they're up late playing video games and the parents are getting upset. They're like, they need to be sleeping. That's impacting their training. They're not playing as well. And, and, I, and I know parents that have gone and just shut off power to that room or to the entire house because they didn't respect the boundary of when they could be playing mm -hmm. the game. And Right, like we were youth athletes, set the boundary, gonna try to play with that boundary, if not break the boundary. But then the parent reestablished it, and and it, it's great because now, like that youth athlete, they they laughed about it. Yeah, thought it was funny. They're like, my dad actually went down and shut off the power. <laughs> like, point proven. I right. won't try to do that again. Right. So if you're not, if you're thinking that the brain is being rotted and it's because of the particular game or from the time that they're playing it will set, set some barriers, set some boundaries. And if it's the thing that they look forward to, make it a reward system. If they're not being disciplined with it, well, that becomes kind of the, the punishment of, well, you don't get to go play that. Give me the controller, take the batteries out of the controller, do what you need to do to establish when and where this is, this is going to be played because, you know, as youth athletes in their journey of becoming hope and self agency, they're learning. They're learning what these boundaries are. They need guidance. They need to be coached. So I know it, it can be hard for parents to kind of set these ground rules because, oh, they love it and they want to play it. I don't want to take it from them. But it's the the short-term sacrifice for the long-term growth mm -hmm. of, of that person. And showing them, like, if you have this goal of, like, you're playing Madden and you want to go to the NFL, like, you can still play Madden. But here's the other things that need to be done in order for you to play at that level. Right. And let's start setting the habits in place for that to happen if that's what you want. If you want more on this topic, we're actually releasing a YouTube video that goes into other details in regards to video games, rotting the kids' brains and things like that. So definitely if you're on Spotify or Apple and you're listening and you want more of a visual, head over to our YouTube channel because we'll be kind of sharing a fun video on that as well. 
Yeah. Hope story time. Hope story time. Let's you go, do it. You going first or me going first? I'll go first. All right. And this is a really simple one. I think it just speaks to the beauty of courage and the beauty of not, I guess, like not being extreme in your decisions of like, I'm never doing that again. Right. Like that phrasing. Um, about a year ago, I think we've talked about my niece a thousand times. She loves horses. She does like cartwheels and she's just awesome. Right. Um, for years now, she's been riding a whore, her horse and she had such a bond with this horse to the point of she could stand up on his back and he would walk around with her and she could balance. And like, wow. they just had a beautiful relationship. And last, I think it was about last summer something happened and he ended up bucking her off. And ever since then, she was like, I'm not, I'm not getting on Smokey again. Like I'm, I'm, I'm done. Right. Which surprised me because she's pretty fearless and she like cracked her hip when she was really little and still did cartwheels and like healed fine. And so it was like, why, why, like why? But I didn't push it by any means. But when we were there a couple weeks ago, I just asked like, oh, do you ride, do you ride Smokey at all? And she said, no, um, cause he needs adjustment. Like if you don't ride him for a long time, he like doesn't want you to ride him. And so he, it takes him a long time to like warm up to it. So she just kind of mentioned that, but I was like, that's good because it's not a, no, he bucked me off. I'm never going on him again. It's more of like, maybe I will once he's ready. Mm -hmm. And my sister sent me a picture yesterday of her riding him for the first time in probably a year. Wow. And I was just, I was so pumped and excited and it brought me a lot of hope because there's things in our lives that we can say, no, I'm never doing that again. Or I'm afraid to do that again. Or I doubt my capability to be able to do X, Y, or Z. And I think children are a beautiful example of having courage and she was that example for me this this past wow. week. So wow, she's awesome. Yeah, big fan. Of for reference, niece. if you've been a long time listener, this is also the niece that had a summer routine. Yes, written out of working out, eating. Yep. One time she would <laughs> wake time up. She would wake One time up. she'd wake up the rest of the family. Yeah, yep. yeah. She's awesome. She's so great. All right. Well, my hope story is that I'm almost off my rookie contract as a husband. Yeah, you are. I'm entering Booyah. into my sophomore season, yes. and my wife has decided to extend the contract, and has reminded me multiple times that there's no rookie in sophomore season. <laughs> that this is a lifetime contract. But I like to look at it in football terms. So naturally, and entering my my sophomore season, which is just incredible. But I was working with uh, a client the other day, and we were just chatting um, about our wives in, in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them that, yeah, my my wife like one of our best dates was going to a basketball court and shooting around, and that she can throw a perfect spiral. And I ran a corner route this one time, and she put a spiral over my shoulder and tucked it right in. And, and at that moment I was like, dang, like she, she is the one. And he goes, buddy, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> you hit the jackpot. I tried to teach my wife how to throw a spiral and it did not go well. He's like, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> and to that, I said, yes, I did. Oh, that's so, very sweet. Happy almost one year. Happy almost <laughs> one year. You savvy cutie patootie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, now I feel happy. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so sweet. <laughs> Have a great week, and remember, every day is not just a day to be hopeful; it's an opportunity to become hope. The Hope Not Note podcast is meant for educational, informational, and personal development purposes only, and does not constitute any health or medical advice. If you're looking for specific advice, connect with us to work with a hope coach. The Hope Not Note podcast shall not be liable or responsible for any loss or damage allegedly arising from any information or suggestions in this podcast.